Hi. I'm very excited to have James Altucher here with us today. Um, James is an entrepreneur, an angel investor, a chess master, um, and a prolific writer. So he's written 19 books so far. Um, two of them, I believe, on the Wall Street Journal's bestseller list, Choose Yourself and The Power of No. He's also written for the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, and a lot of other um, uh, publications. And he's also a blogger and a podcaster. He's interviewed people like Adri um, Ariana Huffington and Tony Robbins and Jewel. And recently I saw he's just interviewed um, the former FBI hostage negotiator, Chris Voss. Um, now, James himself has done more than um, a thousand negotiations himself in business. Um, and so today, James is going to be speaking with us about negotiation and persuasion and perhaps how not to lose $9 million. Okay, thanks, James. <laughs> Thank you, Sky. So, I had a whole thing planned, but on the way up here, I actually got some, a cousin of mine called me, and he told me some disturbing news in my family. And so I had to just throw everything away, and I, I had to write it down because it was a little complicated what he was telling me, but I'll share with you this disturbing news. Apparently, my first cousin once removes husband's aunt's, husband's uncle's wife's, second great nephew's wife's father is Donald Trump. <laughs> So, any illegal immigrants here? The door's there. I've got to change. Every, I got to change my whole perspective now. We'll call this talk the art of the deal. It's all different. Although I can assure you, I don't. I don't even take my clothes off in the locker room. So my locker room talk is like completely different than Donald Trump's locker room talk. I'll leave it at that. About. About a year and a half ago, in uh, February of 2015, as the result of a, so, so Sky mentioned I've done like a thousand negotiations. I can assure you 990 of them were horrible. So I'm gonna start with those and hopefully we'll get to some that were good and then we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. But about a year and a half ago, as the result of a good, a good negotiation that I did that went bad, uh, I lost $9 million in a single day. And it was horrible, devastating. I mean, it's not like, obviously, that's pocket change or anything. Like, this could have ruined my life and or it could have kept me depressed in bed for years or the rest of my life. So I'm going to describe the negotiation that led to that, but I'm going to reel back about 15 years before that or 14 years before that. And um, one time, this is like in 2002, I was in my apartment. And at the time, I was kind of, I was, I was about to lose my apartment because of another bad negotiation I did. This is 14 years earlier. And I was scared all the time uh, because just uh, where the stock market was crashing and I was day trading and life was really, seemed like it was going bad. And this was another time when I was losing so much money, I, I was losing so much money, I was losing everything. And there was one point, uh, I, I had, basically I went to the ATM machine and I looked at what was in there and I had about $143 in the ATM machine. And I'm always gonna be openly transparent. A year, a year earlier I'd sold, or two years earlier I'd sold the company for about $15 million cash. And I just was so stupid I lost, I can't even describe to you what I did. I was just, imagine everything a young Johnny Depp would have done and multiply it by like five and I did it worse. So, so I lost all my money and I was getting, my house was getting foreclosed on, everything was going bad and I was just like lying in my house crying all the time. And then um, the bell rings and who is coming to the house? And like everybody is there and um, I, I answer the door, who's there? The police, can we come up? And so I let them up. I, I, I honestly thought, here's the first thought that came to my head, was I'm going to go out the back door and run away forever. Because why, why else would the police, so I did something wrong. I have no idea what I did. I did something wrong and the police is coming to arrest me forever and put me away where I belong. Because when you lose all this money, you feel like you belong in jail and nowhere else. So the police come up 
And I'm like, what? I, there was a, the door, of course, opened up into my apartment because I had the most elaborate apartment in New York City that I couldn't afford. And the door I, I, is gated the, the, for, to the elevator, so I wouldn't open the gate. And I'm like, who are you? And they hold up their thing, and they said, sorry, we're not from the police. We're from the FBI. Can we come in? And I let them in. And I'm like, why did you say, why didn't you say you were from the FBI? And they said, oh, we, didn't, we thought, we didn't want to scare you. We thought it was better to say the police. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you want? And it's two of them. I had a pool table right there. So they're like, oh, nice pool table. And they start picking up the cues and we're shooting pool. What do you, what do you know about Osama bin Laden? We heard you know something about where Osama bin Laden keeps his money. And I'm like, are you kidding me? How would I know? Like, look at me. I'm the most Jewish guy in the world. Like, how would I know where Osama bin Laden keeps his money? And they told me where the, this guy, um, this is his real name, this guy, Dr. Larry Brilliant, um, told us, you know something about where Osama bin Laden keeps his money. And so I remembered from like three years earlier, like long before 9-11, that uh, this one company that invested in another company I started uh, was also being funded by the Bin Laden family, which was a big construction family in Saudi Arabia. Had nothing, I mean, vaguely has something to do with Osama Bin Laden. But anyway, they were track, they, it was good for them. It was comfortable for, comforting for me to see that they were tracking down every possible lead. But two reasons I tell this story. Uh, the first reason is Dr. Larry Brilliant um, is actually a brilliant guy. He, uh, uh, he runs Pierre Amidyar's uh, foundation. Pierre Amidyar founded eBay. Uh, more recently, he was running all of Google's foundations. But for a while, he was investing in some companies I had started. And um, one time, Larry and I went to the World Trade Center, and there was an antique coin uh, thing happening. He collected antique coins. And he was showing me all these coins from like ancient Rome or whatever, and then he was negotiating to buy the coins where he found value. And he told me the most important rule in negotiation for him, and he had done like, he had bought like hundreds of companies. He told me the important rule in negotiation for him, which I had never heard anywhere else, which is make sure your list is longer than the other guy's list. So this is really important. Um, most people do what I call child's negotiation. They say, they're about to enter into negotiation, and they say, I'm going to offer $100, because then he's going to offer $60, and I know we're going to settle on 80 in the middle, and I'm OK with 80 all along. So I'm going to start with 100, because they're always going to ask down. So that's child's negotiation. That's like, if you want to learn negotiation from Family Guy, and you're into cartoons, that's the kind of negotiation you should do. I've never seen a real negotiation take place like that. Even like in a car dealership, they, you think you're doing a child's negotiation in a car, car dealership, oh, I'm going to start like offering low, he's going to offer this, and then we're going to meet in the middle, uh, and it's going to be good. No. In the car dealership, even this idea to have a longer list than the other guy has, is they use it. They use it in every negotiator. Every good nego negotiator uses this. And so what does that mean? OK, you just settled on a dollar amount, but that's not all. Should you have? Airbag? Should you have Sirius XM? Should you have, you know, this kind of secret jetpack in the back of the car or whatever? Uh, or if you're selling a company, what's the salaries? How long should the top executive stay there? What's the vesting schedule of shares? Uh, where should you live? Uh, there's all these extra things in negotiation. Once this, once the highest thing is decided, the um, the child thinks that the negotiation is done, the expert knows that's where the negotiation is beginning and where the real value starts to take place. So I've seen, I've seen it even in like negotiation textbooks or other negotiations like, you know, anchor them at like a high point, then they, get, they try to get lower and you meet in the middle. That never, ever works. So, uh, so I brought that story up about Larry Brilliant for, for that reason, but also to tell you about when I had $143 left in my bank account. And I was, my expenses at this time, because I was such an idiot, and this was, whatever, 14 years ago, my expenses at that time were $50,000 a month. Now, mind you, just a few years before that, I was making $28,000 a year. So to suddenly figure out how to come up with $50,000 a month when I had $100 left in my bank account was 
really painful for me. So I came up with this brilliant idea. I'm sure you'll all agree it's really brilliant. I had uh, two small daughters at the time. They're, I still have two daughters, actually. <laughs> but they're not small anymore. Um, they're a little too big. Like, initially they were here, and now like they're here. This is sort of like the ideal spot you want kids. So just remember that when you have kids, like just have a measuring tape. And when they're in this size, that's like the best size ever. You're ne they're never going to get better than that. Um, just kidding, Molly. Um, so I had two small daughters. They weren't old enough yet to remember me. So I figured, OK, I have a life insurance policy that's worth $4 million. I had passed the window where I could kill myself and still have the policy be valid. I figured this $4 million would be better for them than for them to have a father. And their mother could meet someone else. They would think of that guy as the father. And they would have $4 million in the bank and not have any of this stress that I currently have. So that was my plan. I started using Alta Vista and Lycos. There was no Google, or I wasn't using Google then. I started using Alta Vista to figure out the best way to kill myself so nobody could figure out that it was a suicide, because I was a little nervous the insurance company would play some game there. And I can guarantee you, just word of warning, there is no safe way to kill yourself. Like every, I don't mean for this to be like the takeaway from this talk, <laughs> but, if this, but if this becomes your most valuable takeaway, then I will consider it a job well done. Like you could even shoot yourself like up like that. And I know a guy who lost, like he became paralyzed, lost half his face, uh, and survived. Okay? And shooting himself the exact way, textbook way, or the Ernest Hemingway way. And um, he married his nurse though, happy ending. Um, <laughs> but there was no other way. I, I thought of everything, trust me, there's no other way. Because you could have you take pills, you got brain damage. Anyway, enough of that. I decided not to do it because I was such a coward. I couldn't find a good safe. I needed safety, so I couldn't find a safe way to do the most dangerous thing possible, um, which makes sense. But it's the same thing with with negotiations in general. You kind of want to pre-negotiate every deal you're in. Like a negotiation shouldn't be hard. It should be always at the point when everybody agrees, this should be like the easiest thing possible. If you're like begging for negotiation to finish or if you're anxious for a negotiation to finish, you've done something wrong along the way. So we'll tell some stories, or I'll tell, not will, I'll tell some stories along the way of some good and some bad negotiations. So one, one way I tried to get myself out of this mess I was going in was with what I call the ready, fire, aim approach. Get it? As opposed to ready, aim, fire. So if you fire before you're aiming, you might miss. But that's often the quickest way to get there before all your competition. If you want to you you shoot the dead animal first. I don't know. I'm trying to make that an analogy to something. But uh, one time I decided I'm going to start I'm going to start a mobile software company. There was, I had just sold an internet software company, and this was back in like 1999 or whatever. I was, I'm going to start a mobile software company. And uh, I didn't have a company, I didn't have software, and I knew nothing about mobile. I had nothing at all except the idea. I liked this whole concept of mobile software, wireless internet, which didn't really become a thing. It wasn't a thing then. So there was no smartphones or anything like that then. So what I did was I sent letters to 30 different companies in the mobile software space. And I said, hey, I'd like to uh, buy you. Uh, and one company, one company out of 30 responded. And he flew in from Denver. And he said, it's just, you're, you're just in time. Uh, we, had, we, had, we had breakfast at a fancy hotel. I wore a suit, uh, which is, I didn't, I don't even think I owned a suit. I think I like borrowed a suit. And uh, I went to this breakfast, and he said, you're just in time. We just uh, got an offer from Ericsson, the big phone company in Sweden or wherever it was, some, some northern Arctic Circle country. And uh, uh, we just got an offer from them for $17.3 million to buy our company. And I said, you're in luck. I'm offering you $30 million. And he, he, and I said, you could be president of the company, um, of my mobile software company. So I called it Mobile Logic. Uh, again, 
I had no, I had no cash. I had no company. I had no software. I had nothing. And I offered them $30 million. And he said yes, of course. And so we signed a document where I had 90 days to basically give him $15 million cash and $15 million equity in the company. And uh, what does that mean? There was equity and no company. Well, OK. And now I had to figure out what to do. So, but I, suddenly now my company, which had no assets before, it had no cash, no software, no company, no, not, no employees, no nothing. But now I had one thing. I had this signed agreement to buy a company that at least Ericsson thought was worth $17 million. I had this signed agreement that he would sell to me instead of a major phone company. That had value. So I took that agreement and I went to every venture capitalist and investor in, in New York City and I said, I, had, I said I had this agreement, we can buy this company and, and we have 60 days to do it and you could be in on it with me. And I had this one line, first there was the internet and then there was the wireless internet which is going to be much bigger. And so everybody was sending me money. But I remember at one point somebody asked me, well how does this, how does this wireless stuff work? And I, I had no idea. So I said, well, you know, you make a phone call and the signal goes up to the satellite and then comes back down. And everybody in the room interrupted me and they said, well, does it go through, up to a satellite or doesn't it go through cell phone towers? It doesn't go, and I, and I, I had no idea. I'm like, well, <laughs> well, sometimes it goes to space. <laughs> it must go there sometimes. <laughs> so like space is out there listening to our phone calls. They gave me five million. They wanted to put in ten million, and I had to hold them down to five million. Um, so I raised that money. I raised thirty million dollars. Now I had a signed deal and thirty million dollars cash. So I used fifteen of the thirty to buy the company. The company I, I made up a value for the company. E everything in existence has no value until two people essentially agree what the value is. So I figured the value of the company was. 30 million, so I gave them 15 million more worth of the company, so now the company's worth 30 plus 15. So I gave them 15 million cash, 15 million uh, worth of a, what was a $30 million company, now it's worth 45 million because of their 15 million. And now I'm in business. I had revenues, I had profits, I had a whole team of investors. Uh, Ericsson, by the way, invested in the company, the phone company. Um, and. I had a business going we, and then I bought two more companies using the same approach and then they kicked me out as CEO and fired me off the board and the company went out of business a few years later. So all together we raised $100 million for that company but we were maybe te 10 years before our time. I think actually the software still exists, it was like a fire sale but I wasn't really involved. One quick story about that company. I was raising money for another company about five years later, four years later, and I was taking a, ca a train, the Amtrak, at like four in the morning to Boston to raise money from a big investor there. And uh, my business partner, Dan, his name was Dan, he was sitting next to me and he was reading Bloomberg Magazine. And, he, and this was right after, um, it's gonna sound like, why did he bring this up? What does this have to do this, with the story? Particularly when he just brought up Bin Laden. This was right after Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat died. So my friends, my business partner was reading Bloomberg magazine and suddenly he said, holy shit. And he showed me the article and it turned out Yas Yasser Arafat secretly had two investments in New York City. One was Bolmar Lanes. I don't know if you've ever gone bowling at Bolmar Lanes. He was an investor in Bolmar Lanes. And the other was my company. So Yasser Arafat was my biggest investor. He lost $2 million on the deal, so if it's good for the Jews, it's good. So, so that was that. That company, so that negotiation was interesting because you wanna, it's not like I was unethical in the negotiation. It wasn't like this guy had to sell me his company. I gave him, I said, I, will give me, I, was, I was honest about everything. I was authentic about everything. I said, this is my idea, but I'm hooked up to major players. This was what I was offering the company I was buying and just give me 60 days to raise the money to buy you. And then to the other people, I was authentic also. I don't have a company. I have an idea, but I also have this signed document. So again, out of nothing, I created an entire company. And what was crazy was a few months later, 
this was kind of like at the height of the IPO boom. A every bank came in and wanted to bring us public. And again, what's, what's a company worth that had just started out of nothing a few months earlier? Well, it's whatever anybody says it's worth. So that's the whole thing about negotiation. It's not, I, I see another child's kind of version of negotiation, which is that X is worth Y. Well, X is not worth Y until I decide I'm paying Y for it. So otherwise, it's not worth Y to me. It's worth zero. So, and that's the case for a house, a car, a company, um, your services, if you're a consultant, anything you negotiate, it's not worth shit until you say it's worth something. So, um, excuse me one second. So all these investment banks come in and they say, oh, we're going to look at other companies similar to yours that are public and we're going to say what this is worth when it IPOs. And so I didn't care about any of that. I flipped to the back page where it said what I specifically would be worth because that's the only thing I ever cared about, and, which was the problem. Um, and it said I would be worth $900 million on an IPO. And I was really disappointed because where's the billion? I want it to be worth a billion on IPO time. So we didn't actually go for any investment bank until someone could say I was going to be worth a billion. Now, of course, then the market busted, and a few months after that, I was fired. So that billion turned to zero. But again, that's why that's the range of what something could be worth in just a few months' time. That's the essence of negotiation, is that you're deciding together with the person you're negotiating what, someone is, what something is worth. And the more you have in your arsenal, the more techniques, not tricks, but techniques and skills you have in negotiating, that changes whether it's going to be zero or a billion. And you also need a little bit of combination of timing and luck. So, so I describe what doesn't work, which is this like child's play, let's meet in the middle. That never works. I've never seen a successful negotiation that way. What does work is no. So this is the most valuable technique. This, this technique is more valuable than anything else, and all the other techniques kind of derive from it. So if you can say no, uh, then you win. So let's dissect that one sentence. Uh, if you can say no, that means you have to be able to, of course, walk away from the nego negotiation. So one time, uh, I. I was raising money for what's called a venture capital fund. Venture capital fund, somebody puts a lot of money in, and then you invest in technology companies or whatever, and everybody helps for, hopes for a big gain. So we were negotiating, me and three partners were negotiating for somebody to invest a big amount with us. Because then we can get started, we can get an office, we could start investing, we could pay ourselves salaries, life, and potentially we can make a lot of money. Life would be really good. So, we got a bunch of offers, but then someone suddenly offered us, and we got this off of a, a fax machine. Like, we weren't even getting emails. Like, we got this off of a fax machine. Someone sent a contract, we'll, we'll invest $125 million, and here are the terms. And I was like blown away. I was just dreaming in my head of like how wealthy I was going to get off of this. And I said, Mark, before, before they hate us, just t fax back. Yes, call them on the phone even, or stake out their house. Just say yes. And this guy, Mark, who was actually a professional negotiator for a major investment bank, he's like, hold your horses. We're not saying yes. And um, this was a Friday. I said, just call them back, at least, and say we got their thing. He said, I'm not calling them back. OK, just, just he, sa he said, Andy, can you take James to the other room? He's like bothering me. And, so he didn't do anything. And then Monday, he, he, well, the last thing he said to me is, I really want to I really think about this. I really want to take this home and, and think about this. So I called him Saturday night, and he was trashed. <laughs> he was like drunk, out of his mind. I could hear the sounds of a party going on in the background, which he hadn't invited me to. I was really upset. And because the last party, he, had, he did invite me to, by the way, and the whole party, People were like pointing at me, is that Mark's internet friend? Like they were just all making fun of me a little bit. So he didn't invite me to this one. So anyway, he's drunk out of his mind. I said, did you look at the 
thing yet. And he's like, no, no, no. Just, I just wanted to rest. And then I'm going to look at it tomorrow. Call him Sunday. Did you look at it? And I said, yeah, I thought about it. I don't think this is, uh, uh, the, the money they're giving us, they wanted to give us $125 million. That's fine, but there's other things I don't like in this. And I said, who cares? Like, just, it's $125 million. We'll figure it out afterwards. And he's like, no, 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 just wait. And so he called him up Monday and he said, no. He said, James, me, has a lot of other opportunities going on and he does not want to do this deal. Uh, and he said, he wants this, 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 and this. So he made his list longer. He says, it's fine with the 125 million, do whatever you want. The dollar amount doesn't amount, doesn't matter. He wanted uh, extra fees, he wanted, uh, but you take care, you guys pay, pay extra for the office space, you pay extra for the secretaries and infrastructure and all that kind of stuff. So he had this whole list of things. And they're like, are you crazy, Mark? We're, we can't, we're just giving you the standard deal. And Mark's like, I know, but James is not going to take it. And we're seeing opportunities all the time. So we're, we're so close. If you want to do a deal with us, and we all want to work together, we're going to be partners in this, this is the deal. And so we laid out an, a totally egregious deal. And they said, how about we meet in the middle? And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. This is the deal. Like, we have other opportunities. We're go we're, you know, you're on the 17th floor. It was, I remember it was 280 Park Avenue. You're on the 17th floor. The 16th floor just called us. Like, we're, our next meeting's on the 16th floor. So, so they agreed to the deal. And didn't work out. <laughs> Most things don't work out. But that negotiation worked out. And I learned a huge lesson, which is, you know, and this is a saying that comes from the self-help industry, but infinite patience yields immediate results. So by watching his patience at work, I learned a huge amount, which is that A, he was patient to say no. B, he was patient that even if they walked away, um, we would have other opportunities. C, did we get immediate results there? Like, did we have results over the weekend or on Monday or on Tuesday? It took a couple days for them to finally say yes after it was back and forth, back and forth. It took them a few days to finally say yes, and he never backed down once. Not once did he, I see him back down on anything. Um, and uh, the results were is that they kept getting more and more nervous. They thought we were going to actually walk away from a deal that they wanted to do. So that was the result. And he didn't say he didn't say no to them right away. He didn't say we hate you. Or he didn't walk out the room, um, which I've seen happen in other negotiations where somebody just walks out of the room, and I don't think that's a good idea either. You don't want to. You don't want to. You're not in competition with who you're negotiating with. You want to be friends and come to come to terms that everybody is happy with. It shouldn't be the case that one side's happy and the other side's unhappy. Both sides should be happy at the end. So every second he waited, every second he was patient, we got both sides got closer to the final outcome. So that was the result, uh, that was the immediate results every second. Now, I say it didn't work out, uh, but it did. It did for everybody. So the company that gave us 125 million, they now have a multi-billion dollar venture capital part of their business. So they used that initial 125 million to, um, to build into a whole business inside their own company that now makes you know, 50 to 100 million dollars a year for them. And for us, how did it work out? Well, they ended up hating us so much, and we had negotiated. What, what I didn't realize when, we, when I said, say yes, and I didn't say, he was holding out for a 10-year deal, meaning they couldn't, they couldn't take their money away for 10 years. So, and I didn't, I'm like, if we just get it for one year, I'm happy. We'll prove ourselves. Well, then the market crashed. We couldn't prove ourselves, and they didn't like us and they wanted all of their money back. But Mark said, look, we'd love to give you your money back, but James here just said, reminded me we have a 10-year deal with you. So they had to actually pay us 10 years, worth of, 10 years worth of salary to get their 125 million back. Uh, by that point, it was like 100 million, but whatever. Uh, so, so it worked out for both sides. We didn't have the we didn't have the ideal result that both sides wanted in the beginning, but because we were both happy with the way it worked out, uh, we both were able to kind of get our, our longer list worked out for us. The initial amount didn't work out for anybody, but our longer list worked out for us. Which brings me to the next 
point on saying no is that you kind of want to have with every negotiation uh, a secret plan. So, um, or you could even call it an evil plan, but I'll call it a secret plan. So I'll, I'll do something simple. Why would someone write a book? A lot of people out there are writing books. More books were written last year than, say, every other year combined since the Gutenberg Press. I'm, I made that number up, but go with it. Because uh, now Amazon allows you to self-publish. It's really great. Uh, why would you write a book? Well, the basic answer is um, because I want, my, I want a publisher to give me a big advance, and then I want to sell a lot of copies and get on the bestseller list and get an even bigger advance for my next book. That's like the basic reason why someone wants to write a book. That's the, uh, that's the child's version of why someone wants to write a book. There's plenty of other reasons to write a book. Uh, if you're a consultant, let's say you're, I don't know, forget it, let's, say, let's even say you're a chef, okay, and, and you write a book with your, with your recipes. You're going to make all the greatest recipes that only use avocados in them because avocados are this amazing superfood. It's not quite a fruit, it's not quite, fa I don't even know what avocados are anymore. Like there's so, in fact right now, believe it or not, as I say this, there is a national avocado shortage because somehow, if you go into any restaurant in New York City, somehow in the past year, avocado toast is on the menu in every single restaurant in New York City. I had never even heard of this as like a menu item before, but now if you get, if you get like a piece of Wonder Bread and toast it and smear like a, the tiniest layer of avocado on it, you can charge $18. And so, so now there's a, a shortage of avocados. So let's say you're a chef and you're gonna, and because now avocados are hot, you say, I'm gonna come up with, this is the, the avocado chef. 100 recipes with avocados for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and lose 1,000 pounds as well. So you're going you're gonna to publish that book, not because you want to sell maybe a million copies, although that would be nice, but also now if a restaurant is a, new, a brand new multi-million dollar restaurant is opening up in the heart of Times Square and they need a new chef, who are they going to pick? The chef who nobody knows about or the chef who wrote a book and speaks at conferences or whatever? They're gonna, Writing a book is an event, it's hard work. So they're gonna hire the, the guy who put in the work to come up with 100 recipes and who wrote a book and so on. So that's one evil plan. Oh, I wanna get hired by somebody. So I'll, my, it's, it's better than a business card. I'm not gonna give someone just my business card. I'm gonna give somebody 250 pages that I wrote. Uh, here they are. I'm the world's expert on avocado recipes. I'm the world's expert on running a car dealership. I'm the world's expert on how dentist offices can use social media because I wrote this book on how dentists could quadruple their sales using Twitter or Instagram or whatever. Can you imagine like Instagram just all before and after teeth? It's just disgusting. So, but if you're the expert, I'll believe you and I'll hire you. My dentist office will hire you to quadruple my clients with your social media skills as opposed to this other guy, I don't know what he's done, you've written the book, so I'll hire you. So consultants, uh, getting a job, uh, getting speaking gigs. Somebody told me the other day, um, I'll tell you who it is, Hal Elrod, you can look up his book, The Miracle Morning. Uh, he wrote this great book about the morning rituals of successful people, and he told me he is a professional speaker. And I'm like, tell me the before and after of your speaking gigs. Uh, be before you wrote a book and after you wrote a book. He said it was between 2,500 and uh, 3,000 per speaking gig when, before I wrote my book. It went up to 20,000 per speaking gig after I wrote my book. This book's like 80 pages. And he wrote that book. He's got a Facebook community now of about 65,000 people. So he also used the book to build a very nice platform. Uh, and the book is consistently on, not on bestseller list because he self-published it on Amazon, but it's consistently on Amazon's bestseller list. A Amazon, uh, believe it or not, now has physical bookstores. And I went, I went to one for the first time two days ago in La Jolla, uh, California. By the way, I flew back just to speak here. Uh, so I went into the Amazon bookstore and they had his book in the bookstore. It's the first time I've seen a self-published book in a bookstore. So, uh, so, so Hal had this great evil plan. I'm sure he makes a decent enough income from selling books, but he makes probably 10 times as much per month on speaking gigs. And I know the same thing's true uh, for published books too. I was talking to a friend of mine 
who wrote a major, major bestseller. Uh, uh, he wrote Freakonomics. And I know in the, every time Freakonomics comes out, like there's been four of them, for the six months afterwards, I'll, I, I won't see him because he, he knows that's like his window for just going, traveling around the world, just doing speaking gig after speaking gig because he's got that window right after a new publication and that's his, that's his evil plan. It's great to get a, a great advance and to sell a million copies like Freakonomics did, but that wasn't his, his real, uh, the real way he benefited in life was by uh, doing these speaking gigs and consulting and so on. So when you're negotiating, make sure in your back pocket you have your evil plan. Uh, and it, it, always, it always sort of works out. And so I have my own company. I have a company called Choose Yourself Media that's, that uh, sells my own writing and, and uh, newsletters and other products. Every one of my employees knows that this is my philosophy. They all have their own evil plans. I encourage them, have your evil plans uh, because it helps me. If someone, for instance, is going to produce my podcast, sure, go out and help other people produce their podcast because you're going to gain valuable industry knowledge, you're going to expand your network, and ultimately, it's a small world. We're all going to know each other in business for the next 40 years. So build your, the, the more powerful the network is of the people around you, the more powerful your network is. So it's not, it's not the list, that, your network is not the list of the people you know, it's the list of the people they know, so, and so on. Because uh, it gets exponential that way when you view it that way. So I always encourage people, come up with as many evil plans as possible. Be evil against me, because I'll selfishly benefit. I'm going to tell you about uh, a bad negotiation I did. And then um, we'll also have some time for some Q&A. So, this is a series of negotiations in a row. So one time the CEO of a company calls me up and says, James, do you want to have our annual breakfast and I want to hear your latest ideas about my business. So this is something I always do. This is very important. It has nothing to do with negotiation. Every day I write down 10 ideas. Here's the reason I do it. If you fall off a bicycle and you're on in bed, lying in bed for just two weeks, you'll actually need physical therapy to walk again. That's how fast leg muscles atrophy. That's how fast any muscle atrophies. Like if you're in bed for, for two weeks, forget it. You're, you're like shot. So it's the same thing is true for the idea muscle. And I, I view ideas as a muscle just like any other muscle. Creativity is a muscle. So if you don't use your creativity for two weeks, three weeks, you, you're atrophied just as if you've had like a major accident to your brain. So I make sure I write down, and I've been doing this for years and years, I make sure I write down 10 ideas a day. If I can't come up with 10 ideas for myself, I'll come up with, here's 10 ideas Amazon should use. Here's 10 ideas Airbnb should use. I don't plan on sharing them with companies after that. I just want to, and I don't think any of these ideas are any good. I just want to keep my idea muscle exercised. So I'll just back off from this story for a second. In 2014, I wrote, uh, 10 ideas how Airbnb can be better. And then I, I didn't do anything with it. I, I just kept it for myself. I was a regular Airbnb user. Well, over this past year, I've lived in nothing but Airbnbs. I don't rent and I don't own. Um, maybe because I've had such bad experiences owning and also renting. I won't get into that. Um, I just apologize to Vanessa Carlton, the I don't know if you know her as a singer. I apologize to her deeply for the last time I rented from her. But uh, like how I dropped that name there. So, uh, so I wrote this list for Airbnb in 2014, and then I just threw it away. I never used it again. It's like in my file somewhere. And a couple weeks ago, uh, I was staying in an Airbnb, and the host of the Airbnb calls me and says, hey, I don't know if you know this, I own the apartment also underneath the one you're staying at, and Chip Conley, the head of hospitality for all of Airbnb, is staying right underneath you, and he wants to meet you. He's heard you, you live only in Airbnbs. So I said, sure. So Chip comes up, he's the head of hospitality for all Airbnb. He also used to own 50 hotels, and he sold them to then work at Airbnb. Because he's a very hospitable guy, he's the head of hospitality, brought a bottle of wine, we started drinking. Of course, I said, let me record this, because I made it into a podcast. And I said, listen, two years ago, 
I came up with this list of ideas for Airbnb. Can I show them to you? And I went through each item, and he's like, hmm, that's a good idea, or wait, stay tuned for the announcement on this one, or no, here's why we don't do it. And I learned a lot more about Airbnb. But at the end, he was like, this, is, this has been so much fun. This is great. Why don't you come and speak at the Airbnb Open? We ha have this huge conference. 10,000 people show up. Gwyneth Paltrow speaking right before me now. And another name drop. And I'm going to selectively, I threw in Yasser Arafat, Osama bin Laden. I'm going to, now I got some celebrities in there. That's how I make value here. So, um, so that's what I, that's what I get. I build this, these relationships ultimately from these 10 ideas a day. Some eventually, you know, if you plant, there's that 80, that, there's that famous 80-20 rule um, where 20% of uh, the work you do creates 80% of the value. It's called the Pareto Principle. And it comes from a gardener, because 20% of the seeds you plant in a garden create 80% of the plants or flowers or whatever they grow in a garden. I don't even know. I'm a horrible gardener. So you plant these seeds with each idea list you do, and only a small percentage of them will actually grow into all the value you create later on. So anyway, back to this meeting. The CEO calls me up. And he says, what's your ideas? So I went into, I had, I had about a week and a half. So I went into ready, fire, aim mode. I came up with ideas, and I, one of them looked to me to be a pretty good idea. And so I called up, uh, I, I just put an ad out on freelancer.com and found a software company in India. And I said, I spec'd out a website completely. That was kind of like, this, is, this dates it a little bit. It was like a MySpace for finance. And, I said, here's what I want every screen to look like, and make it as if the screen is finished. And so they did. Uh, it took them a few days. They came back. And so I meet with my friend, the CEO of this financial media company. And I, I said to him, Tom, I'm glad you called. But look, here's what I have. Here's the site. These are the, each page on the site. It's like almost finished. And he's like, how could you? How could you have been working on this without us? We're like family. We meet every year about this stuff. And I said, I, I just I had this idea. I just went forward with it. And he's like, well, let me be a part of it. Uh, let, me, let me somehow um, get my company involved. And I said, OK, well, you um, have a lot of advertising on your site. Put your overflow advertising on every single page of my site. Because my site's almost finished. It's going to launch any day. And he said, OK, done. Uh, and I calculated quickly. And I, and I said, also, let me write four articles a day on your site and link every article back to my site. Because I knew kind of, he, he was getting a billion page views a month, something like that. So I knew it was going to generate a lot of traffic for me. And I calculated quickly. And this is what happened. We ended up having about 100000 a month in revenues from his advertising to my little site and about a million unique visitors a month. And we had zero, we had, I was the only employee. We had no employees. I just had this Indian software firm build the site. So, so it was this great little business. And so he said, I, I, so I'm thinking to myself, OK, he wants equity. I'm going to give him 3% of the company. And I said to him, OK, this is worth like 3% of the company. And he's like, 3%? I was thinking 50%. And contrary to what my friend Mark did uh, a few years earlier, I, I said immediately, yes. So we were 50-50 partners in my business. Why did I say yes to 50% and 3%? Because of also nothing is worth, again, the basic rule, nothing is worth anything until you say, until two people agree it's worth something. So I'd rather own 50% of something than 3% of nothing. And I, need, I really wanted his site. Maybe there was a little bit I was worried he'd walk away if I said no. So I don't know. It's a, a lot of negotiation is psychological too. But I figure 50-50, he's now he's now invest he's now psychologically invested in this. Three percent, he's not invested. He doesn't care if I succeed or fail. Now at 50 percent, he really cares if I succeed or fail. So what? Why? Why was this important? As soon as we announced the deal, we announced the deal on a, in, on like January 3rd of some year, uh, a bunch of years ago. And the day we announced the deal, I called up Yahoo, AOL, Reuters, Forbes, uh, I don't know, all the other companies in the space. I forget which ones. Interactive Corp. Uh, and I said, 
we, we, did you see this announcement? I'm gonna, I have like a million unique visitors already and we're profitable. We're like the social network for finance. By the way, we're for sale. So this is the day we officially launched. And I met with each one of the, the I met with Yahoo, met with AOL, met with um, Interactive Corp, Forbes, Reuters, met with all of them. And they were starting to, met with Google. Google was amazing, by the way. Like, you walk in that building and people are like skateboarding and there's gourmet chefs and people getting haircuts and like, it's an amazing, like I went to sleep that night, it's like, it's like I was 17 and I had just gone on like a first date with the most amazing person in the world. And so I woke up in the middle of the night and like, I sent Google a note like, oh, it was so great meeting you today. I hope we meet again soon. You know, I did all the classic things a 17 year old would do, because that's how I felt. They were the only company that didn't want to buy my company after that. But, um, but basically then, this other company, the street.com that owned 50%, they were like, oh, we can't, we can't be 50, we want, we, don't, we want to be partners with James, we can't be 50-50 owners with AOL. And I had negotiated the whole 50-50 deal that I could sell my shares. And so that was part of my longer list, my, my evil plan. And so they ultimately, four months after we launched, had to buy my company. So that was a good nego negotiation on my part. Now it's going to get a little worse. So they sent in an extremely good negotiator. I will say extremely good because I learned so much from this negotiation. He said, I, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm worth X. I just threw out a number. I'm worth $40 million. And he's like, ease up, soldier. Let's just, let's just, how do, you, how do we even get to a number? Let's just take a step back. How do we get to an actual number? Let's just say, you, we, you know, you're worth somewhere between you know, every, every company in the space is worth 10 times earnings. Let's figure out what you're going to make next year. What's gonna, let's figure out what you're going to make this year. Let's combine the two. Do you agree on that formula? And I said, yeah, that sounds reasonable because I'm running through some crazy math in my head and I thought, oh my God, I might be worth $60 million. And he's like, okay, I agree to this formula. So he came up with the formula. We figure out, here's how we figure, and then he said, he wrote it on the board, here's how we figure out next year's earnings. We're going to take all your ad space, we're going to take what our advertisers pay us, we're going to look at how many ads you have on per page. He came up with the formula of how much I was going to make next year, and then how much I was going to make this year. And, and I agree, this, this is great. I, I agree to this formula. I didn't have any, any facts or information in my head, just the formula looked great to me. And I agreed to the formula. He was a nice guy, we, we were getting along, we were friends. So he said, look, I don't have any of this data either. Uh, so let's call in the guy who has the data. So he called in the head of sales, advertising sales for the street.com. And this guy sit, sits down and he's like, James, what do you think you make per page? And I, think, I said, I think I make $120 per, per page per month or whatever. Uh, and he's like, no, 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 that's not it at all. We do special deals with all our advertisers. They, we discount heavily. They give us their extra inventory, blah, blah, blah. You probably make about, not $120 per page, you probably make about $15 per page. So, and here's how, and here's the actual numbers. He showed me the data, here's the actual numbers, what we're, what we're doing per page. And so I'm, I'm stuck. I had agreed to the formula, he's showing me the actual data. I had just agreed to the price of the company and I still don't even know what the price of the company is. So it turned out my portion of the company was not worth 60, but was worth five. So, but I had already agreed to everything. And, uh, and I was like locked in, like a tr I was like Luke Skywalker in the beginning of Star Wars. I'm like locked in to the Death Star and they just reeled me right in. And you know, then Obi-Wan Kenobi says, who's more the fool, the fool or the fool who follows him? I was both fools. So, Star Wars reference, always have to do one per talk. Uh, so, so I sold a company and about, and then of course I did everything wrong again. I bought a house, I bought everything, I did this, I did that. A year and a half later, I'm lying in my hammock between the two houses I bought on my huge acreage place, and I'm like, fuck, I'm broke. So I totally had like no money, and what am I gonna do? And then not only that, I'm getting a divorce as well. So, uh, quick little story to end this portion of the talk. Uh, I put, I did what any normal person would do, is I put an ad on Craigslist. 
And I said, um, I lied. I said I had a massive brain injury, and afterwards I had psychic powers. And so if anybody wants to send me an email um, to ask me any question, please feel free. And so after that, I went out to dinner, came back. At this point, I'm in a dinky little motel room. Came back to my motel room after the little turkey sandwich or whatever. And uh, I had hundreds of emails replies to this Craigslist ad. I immediately threw out all the emails from men. They're not important to me. And I started responding. And I was upfront and honest. I'm like, I'm not really psychic, but here's what I think about your little problem. And uh, I called up my mom later, and I told her this experiment I had done and what had happened. And she asked what any reasonable mother would ask. Like, she's concerned. She said, well, James, did you fuck any of them? And I said, Mom, look at what you created. Of course I didn't. This is I, me. So that was that. But then I had to figure out how to, how to get out of this new situation I was in. Back to the 10 ideas a day. Back to figuring out, like, what can I do? Like, always. Always you want to boost that creativity because ultimately having something to offer is the first step in a negotiation. Now, and, and again, by the way, it's not what you offer. It's not about you. It's about them. So in each case, I'm not, off, I'm not saying, here's a great example. A friend of mine had a company that had no revenues. Um, this is like a long time ago. And uh, uh, he had no revenues. But he had a lot of users, and he ended up selling the company for 400, his company for $400 million to AOL. And I'm like, how did you sell for, four, you had no revenues, how did you sell for $400 million to AOL? You, you didn't offer anything. And he's like, you're wrong. It's not what I offer, it's not the, I wasn't selling my revenues, I was selling my platform and the fact that I was already a brand and a known brand, and then AOL was calculating how much money they would make. So I was telling them, you're going to make billions a year on this. So 400 million was suddenly cheap to them. That was like the cheapest deal they had ever done, according to that negotiation. So again, it's not about you, it's about them. He got to a number that he was happy with, but also AOL was extremely happy with it as well. So both sides were happy when he took that focus. If he had came in there and said, well, I spent $3 million on this technology and another $6 million on this advertising, AOL would have been happy to say, OK, we'll multiply that by two, and we'll give you $18 million. Instead, his whole pitch was, this is what you're going to make. You have, you have a billion users. You're gonna, each one is going to be worth like a dollar to you. Cut it in half. Cut the, discount that 20%. We'll sell to you for $400 million, and that seems like a bargain, honestly. And they bought it. There was no, that, was the, that was the negotiation. So again, it's not about me. It's about you, is what you should always be thinking in a negotiation. So those are some tips on negotiation. I have a few minutes' time for some, some Q&A. Uh, and uh, any, any, you can ask me about anything. You can ask me about all these things that I know nothing about, like relationships, owning real estate. <laughs> Renting, uh, negotiating. I just told you I failed out of 990 negotiations out of 1,000. But it taught me a huge amount. So hopefully now I make good negotiations from learning from all these real excellent grandmasters of negotiation. Oh, give you one more tip. This tip does work. If someone starts to negotiate with me about anything. Let's say I want to do a book deal or sell a company or even get a job. Uh, at, at, at a company, and they, let's say somebody offers me uh, some job, uh, and they say, okay, what do you want? This is, people always say, what do you want? And I say, listen, I don't know, this works. I don't know your industry at all. It's like, it's like a chess amateur playing a chess grandmaster, and you're the grandmaster, and the amateur is never going to win. They'll play t a million games, the amateur is never going to win. It's impossible. So give me advice. Uh, what would you say to me if you were in my shoes? And then, no matter what they say then, they're going to say anything at that point. And then you say, I get that. But just tell me again, like, I don't even understand what you just said. I just need advice. What advice would you give me? Like, again, we want to work together, but I can't even start. I don't even know where to begin. So give me advice on what to do, because I don't. And this is really true. Like, in almost every si situation, you know, go, uh, at least with me, I'm always negotiating with someone who's a better negotiator than me. So 
I need to ha get their advice. I need to get them to negotiate against themselves, essentially, for us both to be happy. So that technique works as well. Now Q&A. Any questions? Somebody asked at least one question about relationships or negotiation. Because relationships are negotiations too, by the way. Which is why I'm divorced twice, so. Yes? Yeah, can you say something about the difference between public and private negotiation? Uh, what do you mean by, so what's the difference between public and private negotiations? That's the question. Is there a difference between public and private negotiations? Like public company negotiations? Yeah. yeah so. The answer is yes and no. The principles of a negotiation are all the same. Everything I've said to you works exactly the same way. Um, you know, be prepared to say no. Uh, it's, not you. it's not about me, it's about you. Ask for advice. Most importantly, have a formula. That, com that company that had the formula negotiation with me, that was a public company. Um, uh, so, so the principles remain the same. The only difference is, is that a public company, you have to take into account how the, mark, how the stock market's going to perceive uh, what they're doing with you. So you have to give them um, a perception, not only a value reason to buy you, but a perception reason to buy you. So like when I was negotiating with thestreet.com, the perception reason was, oh, this little thing called social media might be big. Uh, this is thestreet.com entering into social media. This is going to be valuable for you to announce. So, you have to, so public companies care very much about public perception of them, and so you have to take that into account in terms of making it about them. So that's the main difference. Yes? So I have a quick question. When you approached these venture capitalists, did you like cold call them, or did you like know them from a friend of a friend of a friend? And either one, like, how did you build their trust? So, so, so when I approached the venture capitalists, did I cold call them? Um, did I meet them through a friend of a friend? How did I build their trust? Uh, all, all of the above. So, so, and this happens not just with the cold calling, it happens in every situation I'm in. I, 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 I remember someone who was in the business of selling companies to other companies, he told me his formula. He basically said for any 20, for, any, for every, he'll have something of value, but then for every 20 companies he calls about his company that he's trying to sell them, Seven will respond, five will take phone calls, three will make an offer, and one he'll accept. So uh, just you have to make lots of calls, you have to make lots of friends, uh, and you build up your network over time. So now I have, let's say, 20 years of networking. I'll give you an example. When I was trying to sell that other company, it was called stockpicker.com, and I was trying to sell it to either Google, AOL, or Yahoo, I called Yahoo, and I got, put, I got connected right away with the head of business development. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm right away talking to the, the guy who can make the decision, um, the head of all M&A for mergers and acquisitions for Yahoo. It's a multi, you know, 20, 30 billion dollar company. How did I get connected so fast to this guy? And he said, first thing he says to me is, don't you remember me? And uh, I said, no, I mean, you're the head of M&A at Yahoo. I like Yahoo a lot. <laughs> like, uh, and he said, no, I invested a million dollars in mobile logic and lost it all. And I'm like, oh, I'm really sorry about that. And I said, you know, it, it was after I left that the company went south. But uh, he's like, no, no, don't worry about it. This sounds really interesting. Let's work together. And we still work on deals together. So you never know over time. You know, this is the infinite patience creates immediate results. You always keep every relationship on simmer. You never try to get too much from it. You never try to pull the string too tight or it's going to break. You just, when it's ready, you know, it's like fishing. When it's ready, the bait, the, the bait will catch a fish and the fish will come in. It'll die quickly and it will come in. And so, uh, uh, but if you have to like wrestle with it, you know, then you turn into, you know, Ahab. And it becomes this torrential battle and you end up dying at the end. So, and, and the animal ends up dying too. So, so you, I keep lots of, most of my network are my friends, but then they have friends. It turns out scientific studies show, I hate saying it, I sound like a dental commercial there. Uh, LinkedIn has, has did this experiment. Do people get jobs from their connections 
or do they get jobs from the connections of their connections? And, it, and call those the weak connections versus the strong connections. It turns out that most people get jobs through the weak connections rather than the strong connections. So again, that's why the value of your network is the value of the networks of the people your friend, of, that of your strong connections. So you always keep everything on simmer and you see what happens. At any given point, I have like four or five projects going on. I have four or five potential negotiations happening. And again, you see where it's like a guy sitting at the, on the dock with five fishing poles out there. You see where the, you know, which fishing, you know, where you can, where you can eat. Um, so, so, so it is all of the above. In that particular case with the venture capitalists, it was a friend of a friend of a friend that put in the 125 million. And, and it took place over a course of six months building those friendships and then friendships and then friendships. So, another question? Do you apply your uh, negotiation principles to your personal life? Do I apply my negotiating principles to my personal life? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I was once talking to, um, you, know, you know who Kevin O'Leary is? Do you watch Shark Tank? Kevin O'Leary is Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank. And he's known as like a hardcore negotiator. So I was telling him, listen, I'm having a bad time. We, it just so happens this podcast that we're doing, we were talking, is occurring at a, a precise bad time for me. I'm about to get a, a, a second uh, divorce. And he's like, well, you're really a screwed up person. Like he's just flat out said, you're, you're just messed up. And he said, what you really should have been doing the very first time is you should have been doing due diligence on your prospective wife for three years before you even move in together. Um, like make sure you have similar values, make sure you have uh, similar values about money, that's the most important thing, similar values about family. Like you, and it takes three years because the first six months you have, no, you have no clue what they really are, that's when the masks are all up. And then it'll take years for, the, for you and her or Kim or whatever to really figure out all the values. So you have to wait for three years. So at this point you're like, you know, you're, you're a lost cause. Forget it. Let's move on, move topics. So I got really depressed. So after that, I called Judy Bloom, who I don't know if you know her. She was like my favorite children's author as a kid. She wrote, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, the classic Forever, the further classic Wifey. And I said to her, I said, This is what this one guy told me. Am I a lost cause? And she said, No, no, no. Uh, I'm on my third marriage, it's gone three years, third time's a charm. So, it depends on who you listen to. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will leave you with this, which is why I, I answer it in this way. For every field I want to learn more about, and that includes negotiation, and that includes relationships, and that includes sports, or fitness, or nutrition, or games, or writing, I, I want to find what I call my plus minus equal. So a plus is a mentor or a set of mentors. And some people don't have mentors, so it's virtual mentors. So I referenced uh, Moby Dick before, maybe Herman Melville, I admire his writing so much, I look to him as a virtual mentor on writing. Um, even though he's not alive, he's a mentor to me, he's part of my plus. For everything, and this is, I've changed careers maybe nine times and not like change jobs. I've gone to being from like a computer programmer to making a TV show pilot to run, running a software company to running a hedge fund and on and on and on. So, so I always have to find my plus and then I find my equal, my equals. So who can challenge me in my space? Who's equal to me and growing up with me in this space? So you look at like the art scene, you know, there wouldn't be an Andy Warhol without a Roy Lichtenstein and vice versa. There wouldn't be, you know, a, a Jack Kerouac without an Allen Ginsberg and a William S. Burroughs. Like they all grew up, actually those three specifically, grew up together right in this classroom. Right? They all, Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac went to Columbia. They weren't beatniks, they were Ivy League graduates. And William S. Burroughs, because he was a creepy guy, was hanging out on a college campus with these little kids. So they all grew up together and helped each other. So that, they were equals and they challenged each other. When William S. Burroughs was like drugged out of his mind in Morocco, Allen Ginsberg flew over on his own dime 
edited these random pieces of paper on the floor of where William S. Burroughs was staying with like these five-year-old boys or whatever and put together Naked Lunch, which became William S. Burroughs' bestseller. So they all work together. You find your scene and that's your equals. And then your minus. This is not people who are worse than you, although that always feels good to find people worse than you, just being honest, but people you could teach because when you teach, that's when you remember. That's when you really remember. I never remember anything unless I can teach it. So after I do a podcast, for, for instance, like when this guy from Airbnb, I did a podcast with him, immediately after he left, within seconds, I was writing down 10 things I learned from him. And then I remember what I, what, what I learned from him, how he found meaning in his life, how he found a true calling in his life, what he's doing to, to what he did to make Airbnb more you know, hospitable, and so on and on and on. That's how I, and then I wrote it up in an article so I could teach my universe of readers. So, uh, so you always want to do that, plus, minus, equal. And that's really the, the answer. I do apply that to every area of my life. And negotiation falls in that, so I apply negotiation to every area of my life. So I have to get going, but thank you so much. This has been great, and thank you, Sky, and everybody for, for inviting me here. Uh, I really appreciate it and, and enjoy talking to you guys. And, uh, if you have any other questions, I'm altature at gmail.com, say Columbia in the subject, and I'll be happy to answer your questions as well. So thanks again.